<laughs> and there again, with endless money, we were unable to have people hear us. It's amazing how this high-tech stuff gets glitches. Think a microphone. microphone would now be totally foolproof. Well, so we have this newspaper, which formerly had monopolistic qualities, and, and it, like many newspapers, it, it, it was a fine business, and it required some management even so, but it was foolproof. And of course, the world changed for us as for other newspapers, and a million a year free tax is what we have left. Whether it will keep going down a little or old there, I don't know. But I, if any of you are holding this stock because you want that newspaper to come back to its former glory, <laughs> I suspect you developed some different rationale. The, what we did as we, as we were in the same position other newspapers were in, where they were shrinking toward oblivion, was we made a lot of money out of the foreclosure boom. We had more than 80% of the foreclosure notice business, and the, it was like being an undertaker in a plague year. It was, it was huge prosperity for us, coming at a time when everybody else was in total agony. Well, that gave us a lot of money, and, and we used that money to buy securities at, a, at low prices during the panic. And, aided by that peculiar response to the, to the deterioration of our newspaper business, we have entered this software business. And that has been a slow, expensive, troublesome thing. Now we've written off practically everything we spent on it. And we had plenty of tax of income to do that with. And what's happened is that we now have more software revenues than we have print revenues. And that business is doing way better. Now, it isn't doing better in terms of reported earnings. But on the sales field, we're just doing better and better and better because our product, we honestly believe, is way better than the, our main competitors. And there's an endless market for software in these public agencies. District attorneys, adoption agencies, courts. You can hardly imagine anything more sure to keep flourishing and to keep needing more and better software systems. Now, it's agony to do business with a whole bunch of public bodies and their consultants and their, their bureaucracies and so on. And it's such agony that a lot of big companies that are in software don't come near it. You know, if you're Microsoft, you're used to easy money. And this just looks like agony. They did buy one little business, which is about half as difficult as ours. And I think it's worth more than they paid for it, but it's not a great success. So the, the really big boys find our niche in the software market such absolute agony that they tend to stay out of it. And uh, I think our products are probably better than uh, those of our main opposition. But of course, our opposition has way more of the market. But nearly as I can tell, we're gaining every month. So what you people have now is sort of a venture capital operation in the software business with the tag end remnants of the newspaper attached. And the stock may be reasonable if you like highly valued venture capital investment, but for you old-time Ben and Graham groupies, you're in a new territory. I'm not saying it won't work, but if it works, you don't really deserve it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, with that income, now I'll take questions. Yeah. Hello, can you hear me? Hi there. Uh, Max Clark from Marina Del Rey. 
two questions. Uh, one is about journal technologies, and the other is about your philanthropic work. What would you like to talk about? No, no, you're asking the question. Still, <laughs> <laughs> so journal technologies. Um, in, in the next year, could you tell us about one or two opportunities that you're really excited about for journal technologies? And also, in the next year, what's one or two hurdles or threats that you're concerned about? The one that I was most excited about, Kelly Journal Technologies, was getting the contract from the Los Angeles courts. That's one of the biggest court systems on the earth. And as far as I was concerned, a crucial milestone on the path that we had chosen. And you could stop and think about it. If we succeed in Saturday in California with a good success, it may well spread elsewhere. So it gets to be, I mean, not that it already is elsewhere. And we bought this little nothing of a software company. People in the little valley and, and uh, it's, uh, is it in Utah or Idaho? <laughs> Utah. Utah. And, and it turns out that, that they're very good at all this service to all these clients who need it for service. And we now have how many employees in, in Utah, Jerry? Between 80 and 90. And how many do we have in headquarters? Total, total for journal And how many people in our traditional business, the newspaper? Yeah, so we've, we've, we've crossed over into a new business. And the new business is interesting because it's a big market. It's a big market. And, and I think if you ever get entrenched in it, it will be very sticky business which has occurred to us as we suffered all this agony. <laughs> At least we were suffering agonies in an attempt to get a position from which we would be hard to dislodge. So that's, what was the second question? What is a threat or a hurdle you're concerned about? Well, I mean, threat or hurdle is that we want to be the most important player in this new niche, which is a big, big niche. And, uh, and of course, we're concerned about that. I don't regard that battle as won. I regard it as, as, as going well, but not won. I, I, I mean, go to, I'd say going very well, but not won. Uh, my name is uh, Jason Wong. From, I'm from Stanford University. Uh, first, uh, we have a group of students we are very grateful that you uh, donated the uh, uh, Munger building, and many of us uh, live there. It's one of the most uh, beautiful buildings at uh, our campus. And uh, my question is that uh, we heard you talk, uh, say you said that the only thing you want to know is uh, where you're going to die and you never go there. And it's a very powerful philosophy. And then you talk about investing, you want to stay in a certain competence. And then um, a few years ago, uh, Warren Buffett decided uh, to buy IBM. And uh, then uh, uh, he, he's still very optimistic. And, uh, uh, and some people say maybe he walked out of his circle uh, uh, of confidence. And what is your comment about this investing? What do you think of the future? Thank you. Well, IBM is a lot like us. They had a traditional business that was very large and very sticky. And of course, the world changed. And, and a lot of what flourished in the new world, they were not the leader of game. Oracle and Microsoft and all kinds of other people who were formerly not so large. And of course, they didn't do well in the personal computers, even though they, they well started it. And so IBM is in a position a lot like us, where they have an old business from which cash continues to flow, but they want a new product that's a hit. Now, the product they have chosen to back is this I call it an automated checklist. 
Well, an automated checklist is a very good idea. Yeah. It may be particularly useful in things like medicine. But is it the kind of super market that may replace a lot of what made IBM great? And I would say the jury is out on that. I don't really have an opinion. In other words, I'm, no, I'm neither a believer nor a disbeliever. I regard it as a mystery. Uh, it could happen and it could not happen as far as I'm concerned. I do think the old business of IBM is very sticky and will die slowly. <coughs> It's not a cinch. The truth of the matter is that at Berkshire's size, where we have to make great big bets and hold them for long periods, that's a tough game. And, and, and we, we have to make bets that are not the kind of shooting fish in the barrel kind of bets we used to have. And that's one of them. So if you want to lighten on, on, on that one, why, the answer, my friend, is blowing in the wind. <laughs> It may work in a mediocre way, it may work big, I just don't know. Nick Henderson from Northern California. Thank you, Mr. Munger. Um, so I wanted just to thank you for sharing your wisdom over the years. Um, and I would like to, I have two questions for you. The first is, uh, what advice do you give to your grandchildren uh, as they launch uh, young adulthood after college? And then the second question is, do you have a favorite investment story from the old days, for example, you know, Bell Joyal or your uh, you know, Canadian arbitrage you did? Well, regarding the grandchildren, I was not able to change my children very much. <laughs> <laughs> my situation reminds me of what Clarence Darrow said when he read the great poem that ended, you know, I am the master of my fate, I am the captain of my soul. Clarence Darrow said, Master of my fate, he says, hell, I don't even pull an oar. That's <laughs> <laughs> how I feel about changing the children. And regarding the grandchildren, thank God they're somebody else's problem. <laughs> <laughs> I've served my time. <laughs> The second question is uh, your favorite investor story from your younger days, uh, Bell and Doyle, the uh, Canadian Arbitrage. Well, investment stories from my younger days. Well, I've told a story I've never told before. Years ago, 1962, my friend Al Marshall came to me and said, I want your help in bidding for some oil royalties. They're being put up by auction. I soon realized that under the peculiar rules of an idiot civilization, the only people who were going to bid for these oil royalties were oil royalty brokers who were a scroungy, dishonorable, cheap bunch of that. <laughs> <laughs> I realized that none of them would ever bid a fair price. And so I said, I wrote, we just bid high enough to get some of these royalties. You can't possibly fail in an auction where they've excluded everybody but they're kind of shady, difficult, cheap bastards. <laughs> So we bid for those oil royalties and we financed the thing with a oil payment. And we each put up a thousand dollars. And for many, many years, up until the last guy, the muckers were getting a hundred thousand dollars a year. <laughs> fifty years later. <laughs> more than fifty years later, out of a thousand dollar investment. Now, the trouble with that story is it only happened once. <laughs> You don't get very many. It isn't like that kind of opportunity comes along every day. The trick in life is when you get the one or two or three that are your fair lot for a lifetime, you got to do something about them. Okay, so that's, that's, the story. that's my story for my useful day. Hi, Mr. Munger. I'm Robert King from uh, Washington, D.C. Uh, my question is. How does the current energy environment compare to the early 80s when you were running Lesco? Are there any notable similarities or differences this time around? Well, of course, we owned Lesco for a long time. What was interesting about both blue chip stamps, which controlled Lesco and Lesco, 
is that they eventually were some of the most extremely successful investments in the history of mankind. And what's interesting about those outcomes is it was only five or six transactions that carried all the freight, really heavy freight. Now that is really interesting when you stop and think about it. You try and do a zillion little acquisitions and churn headquarters. It's hard, but by just doing a few things over a long period of time and having them work out well, those little nothing companies they were all doomed, the trading stamp business, savings and loan association, savings and loans are pretty well gone, and yet they, they worked out fairly well. There again, just a few good decisions over a long period of time. Some great investment success once said, you make your money by the waiting. Now that doesn't mean you sit around waiting for the next depression, you can't do that. But a fair amount of patience is required in some of these good investment records. Patience followed by pretty aggressive conduct when the time comes. Imagine sitting there having all this money rolling in from the foreclosure room and deploying it in like one day at the bottom tick for some of those stocks. Now that was luck. And it was luck that we had caught the bottom tick. It wasn't luck that we had the money on hand when other people didn't. We're willing to deploy it when other people were. Hi, Mr. Munger. My name is Steve Yang from Irvine, California. I have a question about Berkshire and one about the Daily Journal. Uh, historically, Berkshire was built around its insurance operations to provide a low cost source of capital. What other business models did you try slash consider but ultimately did not pursue? Well, we were always opportunistic. We wanted to buy the best thing that was conveniently available that we could understand. In the early days, we thought we had a special advantage as investors in marketable securities, so we tended to look carefully at float businesses. Nowadays, of course, we've got an enormous float that's not much, hasn't been that much use to us, such is the nature of life. We made so much money out of those slow businesses, it was obscene in the early days. And it's not a tragedy that, that now our float businesses don't get much advantage about the float. I mean, Berkshire's cash, which is large, is not getting much of a return. In Europe, the rates are negative. In Japan, the rates are negative. So. Uh, the Daily Journal is involved in the software business, as you mentioned. What do you think about the attractiveness of the average software business versus others you're familiar with, such as industrial franchises? Well, Software-based businesses, some of them have become some of the most profitable businesses on earth. Other software companies are failing and shrinking, so it's like the rest of capitalism has its good spots and its bad spots. And as I said, the one we're pursuing I think will be sticky if we succeed in it. It seems like journal technology is growing slower than some of their competitors. It seems like journal technology is growing slower than some of their competitors. Um, a, why is that? And B, uh, they seem to be paying sort of very high multiples, five times sales, some of the other you know, companies for acquisitions. Would you ever consider selling journal technologies at a high multiple? Well, nobody's offered us a high multiple for technologies. <laughs> and so we have had the problem and or the opportunity. <laughs> It's a peculiar part of the software business involving a lot of agony now for a payoff way later. And you can't judge it as a normal business or as a normal roll up of profitable companies. It's 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 venture capital. It just happens to be located in a publicly traded company. And and so you have a venture capital type of and it's not venture capital, but we 
first attempt to run away success. And his venture capital over at Works could gradually evolve into a pretty huge business. But of course, everybody's trying to evolve into a pretty huge business, and only a few will succeed. But we're not like a normal software business, and those little companies, you shouldn't call, those are not acquisitions like Berkshire Hathaway makes acquisitions. Those were not established companies that were sure to succeed and relatively foolproof. Uh, we were going to make their, our venture capital type assault on this peculiar part of the software market. We needed momentum from other sales forces and service operations and so forth. So we just bought them. But don't, don't judge those things by the standards of normal corporate acquisitions. Those are part of venture capital. And if you don't like it, why well, you lump it? <laughs> My name is Alan. Last month he sold 10,000 electric cars in China, which is more than 
Tesla sold. And of course, nobody's hardly ever heard of BYP. And it's an interesting company. Berkshire doesn't do this venture capital stuff. And but I hope the Daily Journal works out half as well as I expect BYP to work out. BYP is in a position on purpose to benefit from this electrification trend in the world. It's very helpful to them that the people are dying on the streets of Beijing because they can't breathe the air. They have to go to electric cars in Beijing. And they grab all these sub pieces and so forth. And BYD's ahead in terms of efficient manufacturing, manufacture of these electric cars. So, and electric forklifts in this country, you really want to forklift chewing out carbon dioxide, I mean, carbon monoxide in the middle of your warehouse. I mean, so electric forklifts are, forklifts are a very big idea. They're, they're very well located. So that's a very interesting venture capital investment. Now, it was an accident, sort of, that, that Berkshire departed from its standard methods and did that one. And, and it's an accident that the Daily Journal is doing its version of, of venture capital. But I would say that I only wish our prospects were as good as PYDs. And by the way, they might be, but it's, it's not the way to bet. If it sounds too elementary, please. Uh, uh, I'll do that. Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, so my question is about uh, as as an investor, uh, when you value a business or, or a company, uh, what discount ratio do you assume in the company is in your circle of confidence? Uh, I've been reading a lot, and you know, in some books and in some people's notes uh, from here, uh, they say that, uh, uh, for example, this word bucket use. Uh, uh, a risk free rate, or something like that, sometimes make some adjustment as the discount rate. And, and other, other notes I read from you uh, is that you're going to use an opportunity cost approach, meaning that uh, your next best investment. So, uh, which one of these is correct, or is there any way to read the thousand? Because there are three problems. They're both well, correct. Obviously, it's relevant what the return you get on government bonds is. That affects the value of other assets, the general climate. Because and obviously your opportunity costs should govern your own investment decision making. If you happen to have a rich uncle who will sell you his business for 10% of what it's worth, you don't want to think about some other investment. Your opportunity cost is so great, considering everything else you should forget about. And, and most people don't pay enough attention to opportunity cost. Now, bridge players know about opportunity cost. Poker players know about opportunity cost. But American faculty members and other important people, they hardly know their ass and play about squash. When you try to arrive at the valuation number, what? When you try to arrive at the valuation number using the discount rate, does that does that mean that uh, uh, between between the two rates, uh, you, first you're going to get the discount? We don't use numeric formulas that way. We take into account a whole lot of factors. It's a multi-factor thing and, and there are trade-offs between factors. And it's just like a bridge hand. You have to think of a lot of different things at once. And there's never going to be a formula that will make you rich just by going through some numerical process. If that were true, every Mathematical nerd that gets A's in algebra would be rich. <laughs> and that's not the way it works. But you've got to be comfortable thinking about a lot, of, a lot of different things at once and correctly thinking about a lot of different things at once. <coughs> you don't have a formula that will help you. And all that stuff is relevant. Opportunity cost, of course, is crucial. And, and, and of course, the risk free rate is part of a factor terms how attractive some common stock is. Final clarification. Uh, do you do 
you use the same rate for different business. For example, a Coca-Cola versus an IBM or versus a Dark Farm. The answer is no, of course not. Different businesses get different treatments. They all are viewed in terms of value and they're weighed one against another. But, but of course we'll pay more for a good business than for a lousy one. We really don't want any lousy businesses anymore. We used to make money by buying lousy businesses and kind of wringing money out of them. That is a painful, difficult way to make money, particularly if you're already rich. <laughs> we don't do much of it anymore. Sometimes we do it by accident because one of our businesses turns loud. And in that case, we have to, it's like dealing with the road that you can't get rid of. <laughs> and, and we deal with those as best we can, but we're not looking for new ones. Close to your lips. My name is Adam Mead. I'm from New Hampshire. Uh, I have a mental models question for you. If you talk about these quick cut to the chase algorithms that you use, um, did you arrive at that fluency only after having gone through your entire mental model checklist over a long period of time? Or is it simply a matter of, for example, knowing you're looking at a social situation and uh, so the psychology checklist might be appropriate? Well, if you're talking about multiple models, that means you think about many different models. And that's the nature of reality, particularly if you're an investor with a wide variety of human activities. And there's no way to make that make that easy. Look, you all are in the business. You find it easy? <laughs> Anybody who finds it easy is is wrong. You're living in an illusion. It's not easy. You occasionally get an easy one, but not very many. Mostly it's hard. How many people find it hard to make good investments right now? Yeah, yeah. It's an intelligent group of people. We collect them. Hi, Charlie. You talk about making an effort to reduce standard errors and doing things like not participating in auction processes. I was wondering in terms of your daily habits or, or life habits, what you do in terms of things that, that most people don't to reduce these types of errors. Well, there are two things that Warren and I have done, and Rick Heron has done too, to a considerable extent. One is that we spend a lot of time thinking. Our schedules are not that crowded. And we're constantly, it's a, it's a way more, we look like academics more than we look like businessmen. So our, our system has been to sift life for a few opportunities and seize a few of them. And we don't mind long periods in which nothing happens. And Warren is exactly the same way. Warren's sitting on top of an empire now. Look at his schedule sometime and there's a haircut. <laughs> That's what created one of the most successful business records in history. He has a lot of time to think. And that brings me to the subject of multitasking. All you people are gotten very good at multitasking. And that would be fine if you were the chief nurse in the hospital. But as an investor, I think you're on the wrong road. Multitasking will, will not be the highest quality thought man is capable of doing. Jump in two or three balls at once where people come at you on their schedule, not yours. It's not an ideal thinking environment. Luckily, rather, you are so obscure that you have plenty of time to think. <laughs> and I was in that position for a long time, and it helped me, and I hope it works well, well for you. But if it doesn't, I don't think it I think you're going to have to be satisfied with life in the shallows because if, if, it, if it didn't work for me, I didn't have a number two plan. I was not going to dance the lead in the Bolshoi Ballet <laughs> or stand on the mound in, mound in Yankee Stadium or something. Yeah. But I do think that the, the 
constant search for wisdom and a constant search for the right kind of temperamental reaction to opportunity. I think that never gets, that, that'll never be obsolete. And you can apply that to your personal life too. Most of you are not going to get five opportunities to marry some wonderful person. Like most of you aren't going to get one. <laughs> You're just going to have to pay two with an ordinary result. <laughs> the nature of ordinary results is that they're ordinary. One other question, Charlie. Charlie mentioned earlier of, about sort of serendipitously bottom ticking Wells Fargo. I just wanted to understand that as that decision sort of came to the fore, the opportunity, you know, other banks were failing, even you know, the, the Washington mutuals. Why was Wells Fargo the one, even as a levered institution, one that you sort of thought that at that time, even though other banks had failed? Well, that's that, that's a good question. I'll take you back one time before. When Berkshire bought into Wells Fargo, the world was coming unglued in the bank. And again, real estate lending had been the source of it. And Wells Fargo had been huge in real estate lending. So the stock just this way, this is back when Berkshire bought its first Wells Fargo. Well, the answer was we knew that the lending officers at Wells Fargo were not normal bank lending officers. They had grown up a lot of them in the garment district. They had a cynical view of human life. They were appropriately careful. And, and when, when they needed to intervene strongly, they did so because they learned that was the right way to run a garment lending business. And they were just better. And so we knew they weren't going to lose as much money as everybody thought they were with their big real estate portfolio because they'd chosen it better and they managed it better, et cetera, et cetera. So we had an information advantage just based on general thinking and collecting data. And we weren't using it, we didn't own any Wells Fargo stock, but we were aware they had that special capacity and that their loans, well, that gave us a big advantage, so we bought heavily. That was one. Now number two, the Daily Journal Corporation. When the world was coming unglued, when the Daily Journal bought its Wells Fargo stock, but we, again, we, we knew that the bankers at Wells Fargo was more, were more rational than ordinary bankers. It was a different kind of superiority and rationality. It wasn't this big real estate portfolio on a shrewd way of handling developers, but it was still a, a shrewder way of being in banking. And I don't think anybody should ever buy a bank that doesn't have a feeling for how really shrewd the management is. <coughs> banking is a field where it's easy to delude yourself and report big numbers that aren't really being earned. And so it's a very dangerous place for an investor. So without deep insight into banking, you should go. Hi, Daniel Nefdolovich from Caltech. Two powerful mental models are the concept of specialization and the multidisciplinary approach. Do you have any advice for synthesizing these two mental models? Well, saying your favorite synthesis it's like saying you're in favor of reality. Synthesis is reality because we live in a world with multiple factors involved. And of course, you've got to have synthesis to understand the situation when two factors are intertwined. And so, of course, you want to be good at synthesis. And, and it's easy to say you want to be good at synthesis, but it's not what the reward system of the world pays for. They want extreme specialization. And by the way, for most people, extreme specialization is the way to succeed. Most people are way better off being a chiropodist than trying to understand a little bit of all the disciplines. You know, I don't want a chiropodist that's trying to be a poet. I want somebody that really knows a lot about feet. And and the rest of the world is that way. So this model of being good at synthesis across a lot of disciplines, it's very helpful for some people, but it's not the correct career advice for most people. For most people, the correct career advice is figure out some clever specialty and get very, very good at it. 
and get the labels the world rewards. The trouble with it is that's all you do. You make terrible mistakes everywhere else. So the, the synthesis should be your, your second attack on the world. And it's really defensive. Without synthesis, it will be blindsided in all the other parts of your life that aren't corroborated. Charlie, I'm JD from Phoenix. Uh, at Berkshire last year, you said that rationality was one of the things that was most important to you. Uh, what advice can you give someone who's looking to improve his own rationality? Well, I'd say if you start working at it young and keep doing it until you're as old as I am, it's a very good idea. It's a very good idea, and it's a lot of fun. Particularly if you're good at it. So, I can hardly think of anything that's more fun. So, and I, I think I have a lot of cousins in this room. And, and boy, I can say you're on the right track. It isn't, you don't have to be the emperor of Japan to get fun out of rationality. You, you can avoid a lot of hopeless messes. You can help other people scramble out of their messes. You can be a very constructive citizen if you're always rational. Being rational means you avoid certain things. It's like, I don't want to go where I'm going to die. I don't want to go where the standard result is awful. Where is the standard result awful? Try anger. Try resentment. Try jealousy. Envy. All these things are just one way tickets to hell. And yet, some people just wallow in them. And of course, it's a total disaster for them and everybody around them. And uh, another one is just awful of self-pity. If you're dying of cancer, don't feel sorry for yourself. Just chin up and suck, suck it up and wait through. Self-pity is not going to improve anything, including dying of cancer. Self-pity is just forget about it. Just get it out of your repertoire. Hi, Mr. Munger. Yeah. My name is Stephanie here. I have a personal question for you since you mentioned marriage. Um, increasingly, men and some women don't find the ROI on a long-term committed marriage <laughs> worth it. And obviously that, it still means different things to different people in different parts of the world and has for a different period of time. But I'm curious what your evaluation is of the investment of marriage. <laughs>
course, we're glad we own We own this real estate. Yes, we, we bought it cheaply. We built it cheaply. It's a nice piece of property. The neighborhood around it is steadily upgraded and gentrified as we expected. And nothing wrong with owning a little real estate. Our way of getting ahead was not to be real estate operators, but we don't mind owning some real estate as part of the business. Hello. It simplifies life. Hello, my name is Doug Moe from Houston, Texas. Uh, my question is, do you think a person who can't make money running a New Jersey casino is qualified to be president of the United States? <laughs> <laughs> a person who can't make money running a casino. <laughs> well, he did make money for quite a while. My attitude is anybody who makes his living running a casino is not morally qualified to be president. <laughs> I regard it's a very dirty way to make money. Good morning, Mr. Munger. Uh, thank you for giving us the opportunity to be here. My name is Akash Jali from Bombay. Uh, Mr. Munger, what has given you personally the greatest sense of accomplishment? That's question number one. And second is, if you had any advice to give to a younger version of yourself, what would it be? Well, you know, my family life has been more important to me than the, the wealth or problems. On the other hand, I hated poverty and obscurity. <laughs> <laughs> I tried to get out of them and I... It has given me some satisfaction that I came a long way from where I started. I think most people who come a long way from where they started feel pretty good about it. I think most of the people that finally stood on top of Everest, even though they only stayed there for 15 seconds, <laughs> they're kind of proud of the fact they got up there. And, and so I think that's good. Cicero used to say that one way to be happy in old age is to remember a lot of achievements in your past. Now, some people say that's too damn self-centered and you should be thinking about God or something, but I agree with Cicero. It's okay to live the kind of a life that you the kind of place with in your old look back. And, and uh, what was the other question? You had any advice for you, a younger woman? Well, I'm, my advice is always so trite. The, the good behavior, the being dependable, the morality. It makes your life easier. It makes it work better. You don't have to remember your lives, which gets complicated if you're buying all the time. In fact, it gets so complicated, you're sure to fall off and be recognized as a liar. And so, sure, I think, I think all the old fashioned. Morality works, the old-fashioned discipline works, and the old-fashioned good behavior, and a little generosity. We all know people who, really, people come to the funeral to make sure they're dead. <laughs> you do not want to be in that crowd. You want to live your life so that some people are actually going to miss you when you're gone. So, just every trade idea. My idea, I think Kipling's gift is a great... Poetry. Kipling doesn't exist in the modern college anymore. He wasn't politically correct. Well, I think Kipling's gift is it's great poetry and it's great advice. Keep your head on all about you were losing there, so what's wrong with that? And the quote, be a man, my son. You're gonna be a, why don't you want to be a man? You want to be some idiot child all your life. Some angry twit. There's so many of them already. <laughs> There's so much to be gained by never being an angry twit. In fact, I think anger is just, you want to be philosophical. This political situation we all face now, of course it's disgraceful. I love these people. I mean, it's bad that a leading civilization has candidates for a high office. Any of them like those we're talking about. And, and uh, not all on one party. But you don't want to get angry. And after all, politicians have been politicians for a long, long time. And you want to operate constructively, vote constructively, but 
anger, there's just so much anger in politics now, so much automatic hatred. How can any of us really know whether the United States will be better 50 years from now because we vote Republican or vote Democratic in the next election? Who can tell what the exact mix is between compassion and something else? And yeah, so, I believe in the part of all those things were in the old behavior rules. And by the way, the Muslim behavior rules were read a lot like the Old Testament, which of course they copied. You think they can hear from God that really stole them from the Jews. <laughs> yeah. Hello, Mr. Mangar. Thanks for hosting us today. Um, I have two questions. First is, how do you understand a new industry or a new business you are trying to get into where the, the dynamics are different? How do you get, get the insights into the specific domain? And second, what is the relationship between oil prices and economic growth? Well, that's a simple question. <laughs> <laughs> Let me answer the second one first. I don't really know the correlation between bond prices, bond prices and economic growth. Oil prices. Oil prices. I think it's obvious that if oil had been a little cheaper and easier, the growth would have been greater than mankind had. And in that sense, if oil gets very expensive and we still need it desperately, it will make life harder. And so there, there is that correlation between oil prices and economic growth. And on the other hand, some very peculiar things happen. If you take Exxon and Chevron and so forth, what's happened to make those things good investments over the long term is that the damn price of oil went up faster than their production went down. Now name me another business where you get richer and richer as your production and real units keeps going down, down, down. So not everybody would have predicted that in advance, including most of the economists. So it's a complicated subject, but generally speaking, I mean, okay, a lot of, and there's another trick to it. The people that really have a lot of free energy, like the people in the Middle East, have very dysfunctional economies. They're like a bunch of rich people spending their capital and not knowing how to do anything anybody else wants to buy. So maybe in that sense, having a copper hand has been good for us. My answer to that question reminds me of my old Harvard law professor. He used to say, Charlie, let me know what your problem is, and I'll try to make it harder for you. <laughs> I'm afraid that's what I have done to you. Uh, so the second question was, which? The mental models of how do you understand a new industry or? Oh, yeah, uh, two at once. Well, the answer is barely. I just barely have enough cognitive ability to do what I do. And that's because the world promoted me to the place where I'm stressed. And if you're lucky, they'll have to you. That's what you want to end up, stress. You want to have your full powers called for. And believe you me, I've had that happen all my life. I've just barely been able to think through the right answer, time after time after time. And sometimes I've failed. Charlie, uh, Last year at this meeting, you had some uh, very pointed comments and concerns about Valium, yeah. and I wanted to know if you had no, nothing was wrong. Any updated thoughts on Valium, and are there any current companies where you have concerns similar to? <laughs> it probably wasn't wise for me to check myself. I have no dog in that hunt. I have no interest in the pharmaceutical business. I have no interest in Valium. It's just you people have come so far as a group. Then to tell you amusing stories about life and make comments about current affairs. 
And Valiant was such an extreme example of misbehavior and crazy behavior. Yeah, was calling attention to it. And it ended up with one of the Valiant shareholders saying that Warren Buffett was a sinner because he owned Coca-Cola. <laughs> well, I drew retaliation to Warren. By the way, that's a good place. If you're, anybody's mad at me today, why well, get mad at Warren? <laughs> he can handle it. He's a very philosophical man. <laughs> and, yeah. But it is true that, that these crazy false values and this crazy excess is it's bad morals and it's bad policy. It's bad for the nation. It's just bad, bad, bad. And there's a lot of it. And of course, a lot of it is in American finance. And there's no question about the fact, in my judgment, that American finance, the truth of the matter is that Claire wrong. It was Elizabeth Warren would not agree with me on many subjects. And I wouldn't agree with her on many subjects. But she is basically right when she says that American finance is out of control and has too much evil and folly in it, and that it isn't good for the rest of us. Both Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders, not two of my favorite people on earth, are absolutely right on that subject. And, and to the extent you all see it, because this is not a manipulated huckster trying to cheat other people. And, and so you all see what goes on in finance, the, the craziness, the bull, the promotions, the policy accounting, the, the uh, crazy trading cultures. The, it's, and it's very bad for all of us that we have this huge overdevelopment of, of finance. And yet it's very hard to do anything about it. What happened, if you look back to, say, Edwardian England or a little before, and maybe 300 people, owned, males, owned half the land in England, they had nothing to do. I mean, their underbutlers had underbutlers. I mean, they, and what did they do? They went into the clubs of London and they sat around the card tables and they played they gambled with one another for high stakes. And that's what human nature does when people have a lot of leisure and so on. And paid in, paid out, multiply the wealth per capita of the world by 30 or so. And now we got all kinds of people who were like the lords of England who had all that time to sit around and play cards against one another and enjoy the thrills and pains of gambling. So we have a vast gambling culture, and people have made it respectable. Instead of betting on horses or price fights, you can bet on the price of securities or price of derivatives relating to securities. And of course, you bet on, academic, on athletic contests. We have a huge amount of legalized gambling. And of course, the public market that operates every day with transactions is an ideal casino. And there are a whole bunch of people who want to own the casino and make a lot of money without losing money on inventories or credit risks or any of the other irritating parts of business. Just to sit there and have every night the gold go higher and higher. It's a who doesn't want to be croupier in a casino? And very respectable people get drawn out of it and they see other people getting rich at it. Way, way too much of that in America. And too much of the new wealth has gone to people who are either on the casino or they're good enough playing others in the casino. And I don't think the exaltation of that group has been good for the body politic or for quite generally. And I am to some extent a member of that group in the sense that after all, I might have made my career in surgery. And I'm always afraid that I'll be a terrible example for the youth that I think will just want to make a lot of money with soft white hands and not do much for anybody else. I just want to be sure that I know the paper. He 
even if you do that, very honestly, I don't consider it much of a lie. Just being shrewd about black little pieces of paper, shrewd than other people, is not an adequate life. And it's not a good example to other people. And it's the reason that people like Warren and me are A, charitable, and B, we're only businesses. We're not just black little pieces of paper. And, and so I, I think that we have something going in our nation that is really very serious and very bad. And I hate to agree with Elizabeth Warren on this subject, but she's right. And, and I don't see any way of stopping it except with some big legislative change. Just, and you can say, what difference does it make? Well, what happens is, as the cyclicality with gambling and securities and other aspects goes on, what happens is the big busts hurt us more than the big booms help us. And we saw that when, when the Great Depression ended and the rise of Adolf Hitler. A lot of people think that Hitler rose because of the Great Weimar inflation. But you know, Germany recovered pretty well from the Weimar inflation. What they did is they destroyed the currency. And they just issued a new currency. It's rather interesting. They said all oh, the people that got rid of their old mortgages and the inflation will put the mortgages back and they will back our new Reichsmark. And that had worked pretty well, just like it works fairly well in Argentina or some places, or Italy for that matter. And we will do that sort of thing now. What really it enabled Hitler to rise was the Great Depression. He put on top of the Weimar inflation the Great Depression, and people were just so demoralized that, that they were subject to be snookered by a gutter snipe like Adolf Hitler. So I think this stuff is deadly serious and that these crazy booms should be never done by people like Alan Greenspan. He's an amiable man, but he was an idiot. He <laughs> <laughs> did not make the head of the Federal Reserve governor of all banking. Somebody whose hero is Ayn Rand, <laughs> who believed in no government at all. It was a very unlikely place to look for him. For correct decision making, and he probably got the kind of decision making we observe. I think he's an honest and amiable man, but of course he just didn't see reality the way it was. A lot of people think that if an axe murder, murder happens in a free market, well, that has to be all right because free markets are all right. A lot of those people are in my party, by the way. Yeah. Hi, Charlie. Um, automobile industry right now uh, seems to be churning out a lot of profits. So is it meaningfully different today than it was 10 years ago? Uh, well, the mic near your lips. It's very complicated. <laughs> Sorry, is this better? Yeah. Okay. The automobile industry, is it meaningfully uh, different today than it was 10 years ago? And then part two of the question is, uh, does it make sense to have General Motors in the Berkshire portfolio? Well, uh, the second one is the General Motors is in the Berkshire portfolio because one of our young men likes it. And Warren likes the young men do as they please. Warren, when he was a young man, didn't want any old man telling him what to do. Therefore, he delivers that kind of freedom to his young men. Yeah, that's just the way it is. I haven't got the faintest idea why that young man likes General Motors. It is true, but it's statistically cheap. But of course, and it may be protected by the federal government in the end. So it, it may be a very good investment. But the auto industry is about as brutally competitive an industry now as I have ever seen it. Everybody knows how to make good cars. Everybody. And they rely on the same suppliers. And, and the cars last a long time with very little service. And Everybody leases them at cheap rents and has all kinds of incentives. It just has all the earmarks of a very commoditized, difficult, super competitive market. So I don't think the auto industry is going to be a terribly easy place to get rich. And it may actually shrink one of these days. In other words, the culture of everybody having to fear more cars would actually shrink. Um, and so I think the auto industry is is not a not a safe
saying, if I were investing in the auto industry, I'd want some place that I thought was way the hell better competitor than the others. And that's hard to find. Hi, Charlie. Uh, for most of the oil market's history, there's been some entity forcing production controls. But today, Saudi Arabia has acted more as a baseload producer than uh, controlling uh, OPEX production. Um, would you suspect that this uh, will result in uh, contracted negative economic or contracted negative impact on the economics of all those uh, related to oil production, or is the way to bed that eventually some entity will reemerge and for production control? You know, I would not have predicted that oil would reach its present price. Damn. In fact, if you'd have me, if you'd force me to bet, I would have bet that what has happened wouldn't have happened. But it did. So I know. I think it is generally true that with these commodities, you can get periods of extreme high prices, like we have in iron ore, and extreme low prices, like we now have in iron ore. And so I, I think that commodities can do strange things, both up and down, in terms of price. And of course, they have macroeconomic consequences and huge consequences. If you're in Australia, having these commodities go way down is terrible. And if you're in the tar sands area of Canada, having oil prices go down to where they have now, I don't even know how economic it is to produce tar sands oil at thirty dollars a barrel. My goodness, it's not very attractive, and it may not work at all for many people. I, you're in a a weird period, but I think it's the nature of the human condition that with free markets and stuff like iron ore and oil, you're going to have weird periods. Weird periods of high prices and weird periods of low prices. And I've never been able to predict accurately or make money from predicting accurately those swings. We tend to just get into good businesses and then take the bumps as they as they fall. Would you please recommend some books that you've enjoyed lately? What? Some books that you've enjoyed lately. Well, you know, I... You people send me books. Like 30 a week. <laughs> <laughs> I tend to skim them so rapidly that I no longer develop the i reading. I used to when I picked a few books of my own to read. <laughs> so you're ruining my judgment of books. <laughs> I can't resist reading the damn things when you send them to me. No, I skim a lot of them. And, and I like each one in its way because it's different from anything else I normally do. But I, I'm no longer a good book source. Yeah. Thank you. 
believes income inequality is an issue that needs to be addressed with Senator Sanders putting his campaign around this issue and so many people in my generation starting to feel the burn. How would you address this issue and how would you keep them Well, that's a very good question because it's so overall. We've got Hickety and then Sanders. And my attitude is both Sanders and Hickety are a little nuts. <laughs> People who really were passionate about equality and wanted to bring it about by government action gave us things like the Soviet Union, with all the deaths and the agony and the defect of poverty they have now in spite of having passed oil resources. And communist China, they got equality. And, and thank you, the unnecessary deaths of so North Korea. I mean, I'm suspicious of all this passion for equality that has such bad examples. On the other hand, if you want to look what non-equality brings us, let's just take communist China. Communist China had equality, meaning that three fourths of the people were dirt poor, subsistence level poor. And, and, but they had the advantage to be equal. They were all struggling to get enough to eat to live through. And of course, when they adopted some precious private property and more property rights, and so on, and what they got was living standards as advanced by a factor of 10 or so more quickly than anybody ever had, but of course a lot more inequality. They got all these rich Chinese they didn't have before. And I think it was a very good bargain for the Chinese to have, in other words. I don't think Sanders understands this at all. He doesn't want to understand it. He has a religion. He's had it for 30 years. He's a Johnny One note. It doesn't matter. As an intellectual, he's a disgrace. <coughs> and uh, I think we'd all be glad to have him marry into the family based on his personal characteristics. You know, but, but as a thinker, he's pretty bad. <laughs> now, I don't think he's any worse than some of our Republicans. But at least they're crazy in a different way. <laughs> so, uh, but the Equality has one effect in a democracy that Aristotle commented on. People will cheerfully tolerate considerable differences of outcome if they seem deserved. Nobody minds the fact that Tiger Woods had the big income when he's the best golfer that's ever lived. Or find somebody who invents some new wonder for the world or who's a surgeon looks way better than other surgeons, etc., etc. But differences in outcome that are seen as undeserved tend to disrupt democracy. That's why Aristotle commented on it in one of his most well-known observations. And, of course, who is getting the undeserved money in America now? It's a good question. It is not Bill Gates. It is not the people who create the new companies. Gamble and win. We don't understand their success. But a lot of the financiers who may remind you too much of the man talking. I think we, we have a lot of undeserved wealth, but I think it's across a lot of envy and to some extent. Well, I think envy is always a bad idea. I think it's, it's, it's also never we're going to have a lot of it. A lot of undeserved wealth in the financial class, in many cases for doing nothing, or acting counterproductive. So I think that fixing the obviously undeserved wealth of a lot of people would be a constructive thing. If you take the ordinary investment partnership, which some of you know about run, not only do they get capital gains on what anybody else would be ordinary income, they don't pay any income tax at all on enormous accretions as well. Because this unrealized appreciation is gradually shifted to the general partner. And he takes the securities out and he leaves the business and not recognize the gain. We have enormous liquid fortunes being made with no taxes at all. Naturally, that's resented. It would be resented even more if people understood it. <laughs> but that's not very complicated to understand. 
Undeserved wealth deserves some attention. I think they're right, and I think a huge source of the under. The undeserved wealth is coming to the old finance. Hi, Mr. Poncho. Here. On your left. Uh, you mentioned Wells Fargo earlier and its culture, and the reason why you bought it back in the 80s. Uh, the other journal corporation has U.S. Bank as well in this portfolio, which is more culture. But in addition, we have a, a Bank of America, and its culture is a little different. And I'm curious if the decision of buying Bank of America was driven by its low price, or it's you also see the compound in, um, it also is a compounder. The Bank of America was bought the way we used to buy security. It just got pounded so hard that it was, was selling for less than a quarter way less. And there's a lot in the Bank of America which is sound. Hi, Mr. Rucker. Uh, Whitney Thompson, shareholder from New York. Um, uh, I'm pretty excited about the prospects of self-driving cars over the next 10 to 20 years. It seems like the technology is moving very quickly, but as a Berkshire shareholder, I'm worried about the implications for the entire auto insurance industry if accidents hopefully become a thing in the past. That's good for civilization, bad for the auto insurance business. We'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Well, you're right. If all the cars run around without drivers, it won't be bad for Geico. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't think it's going to happen very quickly. Yeah. In fact, I think it's going to be quite slow. But I think the auto industry, which always before, the first thing people did when they got into the world was they bought more cars. I think that, that, that even if we don't get self-driving cars, that culture may be waning. Not so much in the third world, but in, in places like America. Hi, Mr. Bonner. My name is Cameron from Union from San Diego. I'd like to thank you for being a, a great teacher. You've had a tremendous impact on my life and the lives of many here. Uh, someone, the gentleman asked about books, and you get a lot of books. I sent you some books, and I sent you a letter on Vanity, Proceeding Enemy, and the Seven Deadly Sins. So if you could uh, maybe publish a book list, uh, you can continue writing the books in your personal library. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. I don't want to be a book recommender. <laughs> Here have the opportunity, the ability to do well, but they don't have the opportunity to meet the right people. And Ronald Burke will credit you with giving him credibility when he was attempting to acquire grocery stores at age 30. Uh, who was your mutual acquaintance, and how was Ronnie Ron Burke able to meet you in the early 1980s? Well, the well, last big uh, in those days we had a lot of declining businesses, and one of them was trading stamps. And our last big trading staff culture was the 
company that Ron Burkle's father controlled. And that's where I met Ron Burkle. Uh, it was an attempt to preserve that customer, the last customer we had. Uh, Ron Burkle. Uh, of course, I failed in all activities. Uh, Ron Burkle. Ron Burkle, on the other hand, left that occasion to do nothing but succeed. So, maybe you should ask him. <laughs> yeah. Hey, Charlie, uh, here. Uh, thank you so much. I have two questions. Number one is about Silicon Valley. Uh, what's your view on unicorn companies like Airbnb, Uber, Frontier? Do you think those companies at such high valuation can ever go public? Well, uh, my attitude is that I have a circle of competence and does not include correctly predicting which new companies in Silicon Valley or dependent on Silicon Valley are going to succeed. So I tend to avoid the, the subject entirely and, and make my way in other fashions. However, I will comment on one thing, manipulated finance. As these venture capitals part of the finance industry, the constructive one. These are the people who make their living more honorably than the rest of the people in finance because they're actually allocating capital in the businesses. So, so the venture capitalists are useful members of finance, but they don't escape their share of sin. What they've gotten in the habit of doing is creating these rounds of private financing, and each new one is at a higher value, but they just sneak a little clause in saying, that nobody who previously bought into the venture gets anything until the new guys are preferred. Well, that is sort of like a Ponzi scheme. It's a disgusting, tricky, <laughs> dishonorable thing to do, particularly since it's obscured, and of course it's being deliberately obscured. So, welcome. So, even our most reputable, reputable part of finance has dirty, sleazy activities creeping out, and it will ever be thus. Large amounts of easy money cause regrettable human behavior. It's Munger's rule. <laughs> uh, thank you. Uh, my second question is, apparently the environment that we invest in right now and is very different from when you started, with high frequency trading, momentum trading, and all that. Do you think fundamental value investing is losing relevance? I don't think fundamental value investment will ever be irrelevant because of course, you're going to succeed in investment. You have to buy things for less than they're worth instead of more than they're worth. You have to be smarter than the market. That will never go out of style. I mean, that is like arithmetic. It's going to always be with us. And now, as far as high-frequency trading, that is a complicated subject. I think the high-frequency traders of the world, many of whom are personally admirable, honorable people, I think they have all the contribution to the American economy to a bunch of rats still in a granary. <laughs> <laughs> they just sucking some of the resources out of themselves while contributing nothing to the civilization. Hi, Charlie. Thank you for taking yeah. the time this morning. Uh, you mentioned earlier that you said you change your children uh, with vacations on South Island and things like that. Do you have a specific approach to spending quality time with family? Well, I don't think I want to treat myself as some kind of a wonderful example of family life. I did the best I could, but I have a feeling that they all agree that there's some imperfections. And a second question. To you, a second question. Do you think that uh, Coach Saban at Alabama is an intelligent fanatic similar to Sam Walton? Which, who? The Coach Saban at Alabama. Coach? Coach David Saban at Alabama. I'm better about the bullet ballet. <laughs> well, uh, she has name a few people I especially admire. Well, of course, there are a lot of historical people I admire. That's one of the advantages of being a reader is you can consort with some of the best people who've ever lived. And so that 
that's what I do with a lot of my time. And but I admire a lot of people. Take surgeons that get away the hell better than other surgeons and do big volumes. Think what a contribution it is. Take some actor that gets to be the best actor in the world and moves and entertains a lot of people. And and there are a lot of people who are constructive, intelligent, generous, and improve the world for the rest of us. And there are a lot of people who are good examples. And, and I spent some time, because he was on the Costco board for a long time, with Dan Evans, who was both the senator and governor in the state of Washington. Generally, admirable, sensible, high-grade politician. And there's so few politicians like Dan Evans. And we got all these gerrymandered districts and all these crazies on the right, crazies on the left, who like only people like themselves. And, but when you do find a Dan Evans, you really admire him and like him. And, and I think there will always be admirable, admirable people. And, and my God, that's what we all want to be, is we want to be admirable. You are is the kind of people other people name in their will to raise their children if they die unexpectedly. And a lot of people are doing that. You'll know you're doing something right. People are very shrewd about guessing who will be good at raising their children. Chet Norman. Chet Norman from Lincoln, Nebraska. When you were a busy attorney, uh, mentioned that you sold your most important client an hour a day. And I'm guessing that you spent that time reading and thinking, is that correct or did you focus on some other activity? No, no, that was my most important client with myself. You're right about that. And did you focus on the reading and thinking part or was there some other activity you did for now? No, it was reading and thinking. <laughs> I mean, the beauty of doing enough reading and thinking is that you're good at it, you don't have to do much else. <laughs> Hi, Mr. Moger. My name is Andrew. Um, just a question about fear. I was once given the advice that uh, it's really important to conquer fear. I was wondering if you could speak to your relationship to fear and whether you conquered it. Well, generally, I've avoided circumstances which automatically cause reasonable fear. No, if you want to go hang gliding, you have to select an old partner. <laughs> My son Philip is in the audience. He had a saying when he was young. He'd say, if at first you don't succeed, well, so much for hang gliding. <laughs> <laughs> and so, I, I believe in it. I don't seek out fear to get thrills. I don't even seek out the appearance of fear when, they're, when we're, it's really safe. If it's generally, I'm not a great lover of danger, and or even the appearance of danger. So that's not my thing. And I don't think I've felt much fear for a long time. I just lived a long time. <laughs> I, had, I had fears when I was younger, but they, they gradually. They gradually melted away. All right, I'm being summoned to the director's meeting. I'll take one more question. Way in the back. There, the hand is up. That's it. You're on the Thank you very much. Close to the lips. <laughs> Thank you so much. Melissa Attack from right here in Los Angeles. Uh, my question is about Coke. But I want to just tell you a quick story. Um, today, my 17 year old son had a number of boys over to watch the Super Bowl. I got all the right refreshments, including two big bottles of Coke. No other soft drinks, just Coke and water. There was hardly any Coke consumed by these young people boys, young men, and it gave me pause, and I've re read some, you know, stuff about Coke, um, sweetened beverages are on the decline, and some have, 
suggested, there was a Bloomberg article that suggested um, Berkshire's investment sort of gives Cook management some cover um, to not really address the future of uh, the beverage business. Well, that's an easy one. Coke for many decades, the basic product, full sugar, Coke, grew every year. It was like an inevitable march of time. In recent years, full sugar Coke is declining. Now, unfortunately, the Coca-Cola company has a vast distribution business infrastructure and a lot of other products, and so while what Coca-Cola as an individual product is declining some, instead of going up the way it always did before, the rest of the businesses are, on average, rising. So I think Coke is still a pretty <coughs> strong company and will be a respectable investment, but it's not like it used to be when it was like shooting fish in a barrel. I guess that does it.